ending in there. That was fantastic. Welcome, ladies. We're so glad you're here this morning. You are going to be glad that you're here this morning. We have a special guest with us, Susie Baumgartner. Susie, come on up. Susie is part of the Agape Advisory Team, and you are going to learn all about what Agape is this morning. We want you to be familiar with all things CBS, and this is an aspect of our ministry that we don't have at this particular location, but it is a very important part of our ministry. So welcome, Susie. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Thank you for the clap, but I always have to tell you something. My little son used to say, Mama, why do we clap before we eat? Shouldn't, or why do we pray before we eat? Shouldn't we see if we liked it first and then clap? So thank you for the clap ahead of time. But I am Susie Baumgartner. I'm delight, delighted to be here. Thank you so much. And I'd like to start off today by asking you a question. Do you think that God's love is for everyone? Yes? Any no's? More yeses? Well, I do too. And I think I can prove it to you. So let's pretend that this is God's heart. Have you ever met any of those people? Can you see the is it almond joy? Any of those people that are so joyful, they just exclude, exclude joy. And what about those ones that just dove bar, float through life? with peace. You can just see in any circumstance, they've got the peace that passes all understanding. And then there's those hundred grand that maybe they look okay on the outside, but they're hurting on the inside. Oh, the baby Ruths, those new Christians. I think God really gets excited with the new Christians. And Butterfingers, you know those ones that just slip through life without a whole lot of direction? Oh, the nerds. Now sometimes this doesn't seem like a nice thing to say to people, but these are the people that just delve into the spirit, I mean to the scriptures that love the history of the Bible. These are the people that we want to be, the nerds. And then of course there's the mint twos. We all know the mint twos. I meant to get my lesson done this week. <laughs> But look, they all fit. There's room for everyone, isn't there, in God's heart. There sure is. And that's what we're going to talk about today. There's also room for everyone in community Bible study. And, and thank you again for having me because I get a little passionate about this topic. Next slide, please. So Agape is a specialty core group, and it's nested in an adult class because it's an adult ministry. Agape shares the same mission statement, and we make up part of the all in the mission statement. The same vision statement, transform lives, and I will tell you, Agape participants make the best ambassadors for Christ. And we share the same five essentials. Next slide, please. So Agape started in 2009 by the request of this gentleman, Noah. Noah's mom was a CBSer, and he uh, talked to a friend of his and said, Kelly, why isn't there a Bible study for me and for my friends? And on that request, prayer began, a pilot course started, and they birthed the first agape class in St. Paul in 2009. And it is still going very strong, and Noah is still there studying God's word. We have a motto that says, Agape means God's love, and God's love is for everyone. And we say it as, an, as, as a response, agape means God's love, and God's love is for everyone. And 1 John 4, 7 was the verse that we chose as our life verse, motto for agape. Next slide. So I wanted just to show you this map. It's very fluid. It moves a lot. But right now we have 27 classes with agape. And I'll show you this because, as you can see, there's very few classes on the West Coast. And we really don't know why. But I'm going to ask you to pray with us, too, that agape spreads west. Next slide. So who are the agape participants? Who are we talking about? This is a core group right here. And as you can see, they're adults, different abilities, different disabilities, different personalities. Does it sound like a core group? It does, doesn't it? And the commonality is we all want to study God's word and we all want to know Jesus. Next slide, please. So I want to tell you the options about agape. 
we discovered that not every class could support an agape program that was designed in St. Paul. Maybe the uh, leadership, maybe the community didn't support a lot of adults with intellectual disabilities. So three options were, um, were birthed from, from the, the need, so to speak. So Agape 3, as you can see, I'm going to start there. That's how Agape was designed. The big fish is the Agape director. That's a trained position that gives a central idea teaching. We strive for two core groups, a men's core group and a ladies' core group. And each core group is required to have two core leaders. And that's, of course, for safety, but it's a great shepherding to have both of those. So then we go to Agape 1 and Agape 2. Agape 1, as you can see, is a standard core group. We can have an Agape participant in a standard core group. And, we, and that's the heart. And then the little uh, circle right there is a, a, a partner or a helper, someone to help them through. And they can use the Agape curriculum while everyone else is using the standard curriculum. And it works really, really well. So there's really no reason that every class can't have a core group that would take someone with uh, adults uh, with, with intellectual disability. And then in Agape 2, that's a core group of just Agape participants, and you can see with the two core leaders. So Agape 1 and Agape 2 attended the class teaching, and then again, Agape 3 has their own teaching. That's it in a nutshell. <laughs> but I, want you to, I wanted to explain that to you because a lot of people don't know that any class could take an agape participant in. And we've got uh, lots of resources to help you do that. We also have, this is exciting this year, several remote core groups. And that works really, really well to have remote agape core groups to make the time more accessible, some of our participants. This is one, just touches my heart. One meets at a state home in Brenham. They let us come in and teach the word in a state home in Brenham. We have four online core groups. And right now, I'm involved with one of those, and we represent six states over three time zones. And the word is out, it's so hungry. These uh, participants are so hungry for the word that they will stay up past their bedtime on the East Coast to be able to participate in Agape. And Agape has been used in prison and in a core group with uh, participants that are deaf. So as you can see, it's not just for how it started. It's really grown in many, many uses. So we have the same five essentials as any CBS adult core group, and that's study, teaching, commentary, and a caring community. And did I forget one? Let's go on, because I want to show you how agape does that. We agapefy, and that's our little word that we've... Uh, that we just kind of made up to say, how can we reach our sheep? And I love this picture because that is exactly how agape participants look. They are so thirsty for the word. They listen to everything you say. And so what we do is we just modify and we kind of change things up for our participants, but we always, always, always maintain the integrity of the content and the context of the Bible, of Scripture. We don't change God's word. We just change our presentation and we speak to our sheep. Well, let me show you what that looks like. So, individual study. I love this picture. This is a dear friend of mine who had been to every VBS, every Sunday school, was over crafts. But we rolled out a new curriculum, and there's a lot of drawing involved, and we thought, huh, this will be our test. Well, as you can see, we got the approval from Miss Alex. So, she loves to study with us. In the Agape curriculum, we have three levels of questions, just like our standard, so we reach all abilities. Uh, the only difference is the scripture is placed in front of the lesson, and we find that sometimes going through the Bible could be hard for our participants. So the weekly scripture is placed right in front of the lessons. And <clears throat> let's go on to encouraging discussion. Like I said, looks like a core group, doesn't it? The only difference, these guys come early, and they are, a lot of them come all the time, and they have their work done. Well, I didn't mean to say the only difference between y'all, but they, they are on fire for the Lord, and they love to come and be part of a core group. So effective teaching. We teach central idea teaching, but we try and get engaging. We try and get creative. I think we've got a... Oh, Moses showed up with one during the plagues, and we've got a, a teacher that dressed the part. So we involve our participants in our teaching, and we give our teaching prior to the core group, and we find that that really sets the tone for what we're studying that week. Next slide. 
our commentary, we actually don't have written commentary. So what we do is we make commentary come alive. Uh, photo booth was so much fun. As you can see, uh, the two up at the top, that's actually Barnabas and Silas. Everybody can pretend and everybody can play, right? In a science experiment right there. So that's how we have our commentary. We make it very active. And the next slide. Caring community. This is where agape shines. This is where the participants shine. Um, we have a lady over there with the mac and cheese. That was a challenge to memorize scripture. So we called it the big cheese. Uh, big cheese contest, I guess you would say. So when they memorize scripture... <clears throat> They got to take a box of mac and cheese, put a sticky on it, put a love note on it, and then we gathered those and gave them to our host church for their pantry bank. And that was just a fun, fun, fun idea that they could participate in giving back. And I love the next picture because that's probably the tiniest lady and the tallest man in the group, and they just pair up. She needs a little help reading, and he is always right there to help. They're so encouraging. Uh, almost anything you say for a prayer request, they come back and they go, you've got this, Susie. You've got this, Susie. So very encouraging and caring. And then, next slide, please. Let's get the word out. I want to tell you really quickly about this group. This is the Villages in Florida. They had an opening like this last spring about the same time. Hearts were touched. Seeds were planted in the fall. They started with a core group of two core leaders plus another permanent volunteer, 10, and I think they're up to maybe 20 now. They're actually going to start another core group next fall because it's grown so much and the word is out. So it just takes God's heart to, to quicken us, doesn't it, to start. So I really ask of y'all, if you know somebody in the nation that maybe would like to, to get in touch with us because we can probably plug them in online if they don't have an agape right there. Or we can uh, ask the core group if they could have a place and uh, invite somebody to study. So that's something that you can help us with, is getting the word out. Because what we saw is, just by telling more about agape, another class was birthed. So how can you help? Pray. That's what we need a lot of, prayer. Please pray that these seeds come to fruition, especially in the West Course. Because I truly believe that we're a ministry of 15 years, but a lot of people really don't know what we're about. So again, I thank you for this opportunity. And talk to friends, talk to people. Tell them that there is an agape at CBS. Go to uh, Leslie, Leslie will go to Terry. Terry can come to me, your, your AD can come to me, and we can see about getting people plugged in. So tell others, uh, and if your hearts are beating right now, I hope they are. I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand, but I hope there are some hearts that are beating out there. Again, if you'd like to know more or you think that maybe that's something that you would like to explore, go to your servants team. Your servants team goes to your area director. They come to me. I might come out here again, so we'll see how that goes. Um, what we do as the advisory team, when a class is started, we pray with you. From the time of, I think I might like this, to the conception of the class. We support you and we provide resources. So this might be a new ministry to some, but we've got lots of help that we can help you with that. So I'm gonna leave you with a challenge. We always have a challenge, right, in CBS? And it is, will you choose to tell others about Agape so that we can truly make community Bible study available to all? Well, the Lord asked me to give you a blessing. And it's through the words of Moses. And I'm not going to put this on because I don't want to mess up the mic, but you're going to get the idea. And the Lord says to you, bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. <clears throat> the Lord turn up his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you so much, Susie. Wow, that was just amazing and bursting with your enthusiasm. And we can see how much she loves this program. And it would be great um, if it grows. And so we will be praying along with Susie. If you're interested in talking with her, she will be around all of this morning. But right now, you guys are dismissed to your core groups. So go have a great day. Hopefully you had a great discussion time in your core groups this morning. Our children, as always, have a great lesson this morning. They are talking about the widow's might, uh, the widow's coin.
the story of Jesus was looking on as people were making their offerings and several people were dumping loads of money in and the widow came and she dropped two coins in and Jesus observed and he spoke to his disciples about how she gave more than anyone else. So your kiddos are hearing that story today. They're doing lots of things with money and coins and they're gonna have a great time back there doing that. We wanna thank um, Carol Calicott's group. They are love ladies this morning and back there cutting away and being extra hands in our um, classrooms. So we couldn't do it without you guys. Thank you so much. I hope that you were all here on time this morning to hear our opening because it was fabulous. Um, we had Susie Baumgartner from the Woodlands who's one of our Agape advisory team members. If you um, would like some more information on Agape, there's a little table out front and there's a red heart sticker you can stick somewhere in your Bible to remind you to pray for the Agape ministry of CBS and we would love it if you would join us in doing that. So. Um, we're getting started in a, in a new book this morning. We're opening up the book of Titus, and it's exciting to be studying yet another book of the Bible. And chronologically, we are stepping back in time just a little bit from where we ended last week, uh, finishing up 2 Timothy. Um, the letter to Titus was written between Paul's two Rome imprisonments, most likely around 64 A.D., and he probably wrote it from Macedonia where he had traveled after his first time in prison. And this is roughly the same time frame that he wrote 1 Timothy. And I'm sure you noted and probably maybe discussed in your core group this morning, there are a lot of similarities between 1 Timothy and this letter to Titus. Paul, who was educated, articulate, motivated and full of the Holy Spirit had been preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ all over the Roman Empire. And we know that he faced opposition in a lot of areas, but we also know that he brought many people to Christ in other areas and churches were springing up. But Paul knew that the churches were to be built on the foundation of Jesus Christ, not on any single person. And so, as any good leader, Paul was intentional about training up younger godly men um, to take over. He wouldn't always be around to encourage and discipline and train and build up, so he wanted to have people who were, and Titus was one of those. Um, Let's look at the historical context of Titus. He was a native of Greece, and he was a Gentile by birth. So unlike Timothy, Titus had no Lois and Eunice in his family heritage to have taught him scripture. He came to Christ probably through one of Paul's first missionary journeys, and we know that because of the way Paul introduces him as a true child in the common faith. We know from Galatians 2 that Paul had taken Titus to Jerusalem for a very important meeting with church leaders there. And the purpose of that meeting, we're going to see it play out in our text today. Paul took Titus with him to show the church leaders and the other apostles and Jewish believers that a Gentile could love the Lord just as much as they did. And moreover, that he could have, because of grace and through faith in Christ alone, he could have salvation just as the Jews did. So some of you who are with us when we studied Acts, you might remember the term Judaizers. These were Jewish believers who hadn't quite grasped the concept of grace yet. And so they were teaching that circumcision was a requirement for salvation. They taught that unless Gentile men were circumcised according to Old Testament law, that they couldn't um, be saved. But Jesus' death on the cross had ushered in a new covenant. And so circumcision, which was an outward symbol of an inward change, was no longer required. And so Paul took Titus with him to Jerusalem. And Titus was Paul's living, breathing example that um, converting to Judaism symbolized by the act of circumcision was not required. Titus and all Gentiles, including me and you, are dependent only on one thing for our salvation, and that is the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So let's pray before we dive into our scriptures this morning. 
Father God, thank you for the truth of your word and the freedom and the opportunity to study it. Lord, use me this morning. May I speak only your truth, nothing more and nothing less. May it touch our hearts and transform our lives for your glory. In your son's precious name we pray, amen. So I dug out a map from back when we studied Acts so that we could look at where Crete is located. And um, although scripture doesn't tell us about when Paul and Titus were together in Crete, um, most commentaries think that they traveled there at one time before together and um, Paul left and left Titus there on the island to continue to minister to the churches. And so as you can see, it's a large island and it's centrally located in the Mediterranean. And so because of that, at one time, it was really a flourishing civilization. But by the time of Paul's writing to Titus, things had really deteriorated. And in fact, commentaries indicate that the moral condition of the inhabitants of the island had deteriorated a lot as well. Their ferocity and their fraud were widely attested to. The wine on this island was apparently very famous and drunkenness prevailed. Paul even uses a quote from a famous Cretan poet, Epimendes, who lived before Jesus to give us a clear picture of what Titus was facing. Paul says, one of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. So if a Cretan spoke that negatively about his own people, things had to be pretty bad. And in the Greek culture at that time, to call someone a Cretan was synonymous with calling them a liar. Now, I've never heard that saying, but apparently that's still a saying to this day. There were several people yesterday in leadership who recognized that, that saying. So basically, those who would be in leadership in churches there had a very big task ahead of them. Congregations were struggling to stand on the truth and to stand in godliness in a culture that was devoted to lies and impurity. Now, I can't imagine that it's any worse than what we are dealing with in our um, society today. So these words of Paul's to Titus about the organization of and how to... Um, feed and mature and grow your churches is, is very applicable to us today as well. So first, what Titus needed to do was to appoint elders in every city and to put what remains in order. And the translation of those words, putting into order, comes from some Greek medical terms that actually describe the process of, of setting a bone, like if you broke a bone, of setting the bone um, or, or setting... Um, breaking bones to straighten them. So change was coming to Crete. And the fact that Paul gives this charge in writing will, will serve to support Titus and to give him authority. So Paul gives Titus a list of quali qualifications for elders or the overseers. And I know that you went through these in your core group this morning, and they're very similar to what we went through in Timothy, 1 Timothy. So I'm not gonna belabor the specifics, but to sum it up, Elders, leaders in the church um, must be godly men who are leading their families well. They are above reproach and they hold strongly to sound doctrine. These must be men whose actions do not deny the doctrine that they profess to believe. And this was going to be challenging in Crete because of the moral conditions there. And this is probably the reason that elders hadn't been appointed the first time that Paul was there on the island. It's because no one had the spiritual maturity required. More time was needed to train and to develop men in the faith. All churches need a plan for training and bringing up people for spiritual leadership. Any body of believers that lacks um, qualified leadership is vulnerable to many problems. And one of those problems is false teaching. Paul says, for there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. So one of the specific varieties of false teaching 
in Crete was exactly what Paul and Titus had experienced before. People teaching that circumcision was required for salvation. And I just love seeing this illustration of how God went before Titus, uniquely equipping him for this particular task in Crete. Because Titus had heard Paul argue on his behalf that he had made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. And by the grace of God, through faith in Christ alone, Titus enjoyed the promise of eternal life, just as any believing Jew did, whether circumcised or not. So Paul doesn't mince words in his instruction to, to Titus. He says Titus must silence these teachers because they've already turned families, whole families, away from the truth. The negative impact of their teaching was far-reaching, and so the rebuke had to be harsh. And I think there's temptation in the church today to not confront destructive and divisive error. And to be soft on such matters can lead to devastating results, similar to what we talked about a few weeks ago, the gangrene and how it spreads. False teaching can seep in and can, can take hold and spread and lead to widespread destruction. And it seems that this is where Crete was headed and Titus was going to turn things around because, of course, the goal of a sharp rebuke was that the Cretans could eventually be made sound in their faith. Um, verse, verse 15 was confusing to me, and so I want to walk through it. I understood it more clearly after looking up several translations. So, Rochelle, I think you've got the, new, um, the Living Bible translation. A person who is pure of heart sees goodness and purity in everything. But a person whose heart is evil and untrusting finds evil in everything. For his dirty mind and rebellious heart color all that he sees and hears. The bottom line in this verse is that our minds reflect our hearts. And we know that no matter how hard we strive to have a pure heart, a completely pure heart, it can't happen on our own strength. We are pure only because of the washing and regeneration of the blood of Jesus Christ. Charles Spurgeon does a good job of explaining here. He says, no one is pure who has not been born again by faith in Jesus Christ. And even then, sin remains. But those who are quote unquote pure they repent of their sin and they don't let it be the characteristic of their life. We identify people as pure or evil based on their predominant characteristics. And so Paul is saying the Cretans, based on the predominant characteristics of their lives, they deny the very God that they claim to believe in, making them unfit for any good work. So elders and church leaders aren't the only ones that should live lifestyles that are consistent with their beliefs. Yes, church leaders, they're going to be held to a higher standard, but the entire church body should live that way. And so Paul changes the emphasis of his focus when he goes into chapter 2, and um, he starts talking about how the church um, should develop into a spiritual body that is beautiful and that attracts others to our Savior. And I love the way Paul summarizes this theme in verse 10. So that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of our Savior. Now here Paul's finishing a sentence about how believing slaves should behave. But slaves are just one of the many people that he's going to address. And we're going to back up and talk about each one of those. But I think this verse is a great place to start. So the definition of adorn is to lend beauty to, to enhance, or to decorate, such as with ornaments. And it's translated from the Greek word cosmio, which starts with a K, but that is actually the root word of our word for cosmetic. And cosmio also conveys the idea of arranging something in a in a beautiful or perfect order so as to give it symmetry and beauty, making something pleasing to the eye rather than jumbled. So the word doctrine, as used in Scripture, is a broad reference to the entire body of essential 
theological truths that define and describe the gospel message. So basically in verse 10, Paul is saying, as members of the body of Christ, we are called to behave in such a way that adorns the gospel. Our actions should beautify the gospel and attract people to it and to Jesus. So we're going to do a little audience participation here this morning. We are a group of 400-ish women, and um, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. But before I do, I need to say that we need complete honesty, ladies. Complete honesty. We're at Bible study after all, right? Okay. Raise your hand if you did not, did not look in the mirror this morning before you came. I can't see very well, but I don't see any hands. I think we all did. We are a diverse group of women, and all of us have a very unique morning routine, I'm sure. Some of us, it may take us five minutes to get ready, and some of us, 30 minutes. Um, Some of us adorn our faces with cosmetics. Some of us don't. Some of us adorn ourselves with jewelry. Others don't. Some of us are into fashion and clothing, and so we may adorn ourselves with clothing, even shoes and handbags, and others don't. Hopefully, none of us have forgotten what we just learned in 1 Timothy 2.9, where it said we shouldn't focus on adorning ourselves with braids and pearls and gold or expensive clothing. But as Leslie taught that week, um, it's, it's not wrong to wear those things, but what the scripture is telling us is that if that's the way we focus on our adornment, that's not what we should be focusing on. We should be, to make ourselves more beautiful, we should be adorning ourselves with godliness. And then that, in turn, points others to Christ. And they're more attracted to the gospel message. So if we go back to the mirror illustration, much of what we do in the morning is simply to make ourselves more pleasing in the sight of others. And so I dare say that all of us probably brushed our teeth this morning and at least put a comb to our hair. Because if we came here and we had breakfast still in our teeth and maybe some drool from the night before and that hair disheveled, it's, it sends a message, one, that we don't care, but it can be a little maybe off-putting. So we don't want our actions in any way to be off-putting to others, to be dishonoring to the doctrine that we say that we believe in. Non-believers are watching. And when our actions don't adorn our doctrine, when our actions aren't in sync with what we believe, It can be dishonoring to the gospel, and it can send non-believers running the other way. So let's look at how Titus was encouraged to coach various groups within the body of Christ to adorn the doctrine of our Savior. He says, older men should be sober-minded, dignified, and self-controlled. They should be sound in faith and love and steadfastness. And in this way, they would adorn the gospel of our Savior. Self-control was a major point for the younger men, too. And as a mom of two adult young men, I know that's a constant prayer. When speaking of the younger men, Paul asked Titus to be an example to them. He says, let everything you do reflect the integrity and the seriousness of your teaching. Now, he wasn't telling Titus to be a stick in the mud. He wasn't saying you can never be fun. But he was saying, when it comes to your teaching about the gospel of Jesus Christ, your speech about Jesus, it has to be sound so that those in opposition would have nothing, no basis for saying anything negative. Like Timothy, Titus will also need to address slaves in the church. Now, Paul doesn't ever condone slavery, but he gives instruction for believers to function within that system that was so prevalent in the Roman Empire at that time. Slaves were encouraged to obey their masters. They should not talk back or engage in petty theft, which was 
you know, running rampant in that um, scenario. They must show themselves to be entirely trustworthy. And in this way, the slaves could adorn the doctrine of our Savior. Older women, they shouldn't be gossipers or heavy drinkers. They should be examples of what is good. They should invest time in training younger women. Training women to love their husbands and their children, to live wisely, to be pure, and to take care of their homes and families. And there's specific instruction for the older women in the area of being examples to the younger ones as far as submitting to your husbands. And this instruction, we know, ladies, it appears several times in Scripture. And it, God repeats it because it's not a natural tendency of ours. But we have to remember marriage is to display God's glory, not our human nature. In a God-honoring marriage, submission is something for the wife to embrace, not for the husband to enforce. And by God's design, a flourishing marriage flows from radical other, radical other-centeredness. And that doesn't mean that women have to be doormats. Great strength can be shown in submitting to God's design for marriage, which puts the man at the head of the household. So living this out beautifies or adorns the doctrine of our Savior. And when I talk about older women training up younger women, I can't help but share about my personal experience here at CBS. I joined CBS when I was 32 and had only one child. My daughter Erin was two and a half at the time. And she happens to be in the audience today just because we have a funeral to get to after this. She's now 28 years old. At that time, I had been a believer for a while, but I had never, I was struggling to find my way as a parent and as a wife. And I had never experienced the way a believing community could impart spiritual wisdom and nurture spiritual growth the way that I did here at CBS. My very first core leader, Karen Conway, and several other more mature women, women in that group that first year were a huge encouragement to me in helping me find my way as a young mom and as a wife. I didn't know it at the time, but they and many others in subsequent various core groups um, were training me in righteousness. And I am still in training, and I'm very happy to be able to do it here every week with you all. Now I feel like the roles are reversed. I often sit in core groups, and I am in awe of the fresh insight of some of you younger women. Just a few weeks ago, I visited a core group, and I saw our scriptures just displayed right before my eyes as a group, a couple of seasoned, more seasoned women were encouraging a younger woman to step in a, into a leadership role at her church. And they prayed over her, and it was a beautiful thing. And so I think that CBS is just a wonderful example of what Titus should encourage the women of Crete um, how to behave in um, I also love the diversity that's represented in the church body in this text. Um, Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. The diversity in this body of believers, the diversity in a church body, Paul includes every possible group in this encouragement. Sex, Social status, background, none of that matters. We are all made in the image of God. And although Jesus was the complete fullness of God's character when he walked on earth, we are the next best thing since Jesus is not here any longer. God can reveal himself and draw others to him through us. His desire is for each of us to develop Christ-like character and Christ-like conduct that displays his beauty to the lost and misdirected world around us. But if we are living 
a lifestyle inconsistent with what we believe, then the beauty of the Lord Jesus is not visible to others. All that they see is a veneer of worldliness. So I encourage you, tomorrow morning and every morning, as you are getting ready in front of the mirror, to think about today's lesson. And let us choose to be women whose actions beautifully adorn the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Thank you, Father God, for this beautiful message and for letting us know how we can partner with you and we can point others to you by your grace through faith alone in Jesus alone. Thank you for your gospel truth. In your son's holy and precious name we pray. Amen.